Welcome to Perkins eLearning's webinar series. My name is Robin. Today we're welcoming Amanda Martinage for a presentation on sensory processing. Perkins eLearning webinars are presented throughout the year on a monthly basis as live events or pre-recorded presentations such as today's discussion. Our webinar series is just one of the offerings in our professional development program, which includes publications, e-newsletters, webcasts, online and in-person classes, and self-paced study. You can see our entire listings at our website, perkinselearning.org. Today's presentation will address a range of sensory processing difficulties and identify strategies for supporting educational goals in the presence of these conditions. We are recording this in September of 2015 on the Perkins campus. When viewing this recorded presentation, you will find that headphones or earbuds or external speakers give the best sound. Amanda Martinage is a school-based occupational therapist working for Case Collaborative. Amanda gained experience in a variety of settings, including residential, inpatient rehabilitation, outpatient, and early intervention, providing a wide scope of practice as a frame of reference. She is committed to increasing others' understanding and skill when working with students with disabilities and has traveled internationally to support this mission. Welcome to Perkins, Amanda. Thank you. And thank you for your, for your interest in this webinar, Applying Sensory Processing Techniques to Positively Impact Behavior. Part one, we'll be discussing sensory processing and dysfunction. Uh, the objectives for this webinar are to provide an overview of sensory processing, to outline sensory processing and dysfunction related to each area, discussing sensory processing as an accepted diagnosis, presenting the current assessment tools, and the implications of sensory processing on behavior. Why is understanding sensory processing important? Well, for educators and for parents uh, who look and work with children and we pay attention to their behavior and their learning, sensory processing has implications on behavior and learning. And research indicates that sensory-based techniques positively influence behavior. And because of that, the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health made the use of sensory strategies mandatory for inpatient psychiatric settings in 2006. So that's a pretty important uh, piece of information, having a, a large licensing agency dictating the use of sensory-based strategies uh, makes us really take a look and say, all right, these, these strategies really do seem to, to be working. So what is sensory processing? It is how our bodies process and organize information from our senses. So we're using that information and responding appropriately, hopefully appropriately, in particular situations. So we're using input from our senses, from movement, and from gravity. So sensory processing is broken up into several different areas. The first area we'll discuss is sensory modulation. And this is an area that you tend to hear about the most, that gets the most press these days. So sensory modulation is the ability to take in sensory information from your environment, decide what is relevant, and to make an appropriate adaptive behavioral response. So it's really allowing you to screen out any sort of meaningless information in your environment and really respond to what's important at that moment. So as we go through the different areas in sensory modulation, I am going to remind you that we all have a little bit of dysfunction in our lives. So when we have a difficulty, it's how we manage that difficulty that really tells us whether or not there's dysfunction. So if you are having a difficulty during your day, but you're able to manage that difficult time and move on, then you are functional. But if you come across some sort of difficulty and then you have a big tantrum and you're not able to complete your, your activity that you're, that you're participating in, then that's where we have an issue. So we'll move on to the first section, which is your tactile system. Your tactile system includes light touch, deep pressure, 
vibration, hot and cold, and pain. And the major purpose of your tactile system, first and foremost, is to keep you safe. And another very important component of your tactile system is that it allows you to bond with others and to develop social and emotional connections. So I'm going to show you some examples of tactile experiences. This first one is a boy who's in a ball pit and he is just has all sorts of bombarding of his tactile system. He's like swimming around in the ball pit so he's getting all sorts of information to his arms and his legs and to his his body. This next one is a little boy who is cuddling up in either a beanbag chair or a marshmallow. People call them different things, but he's snuggling in and, and getting that input to his body. This picture shows a couple little ones feeling um, some, some people call them stepping stones, and they have a tactile component. So they, they have their hands and their bare feet touching. Um, the different texture of that stone. Swimming is an example of a tactile experience. And then tactile also includes your mouth. So this is a little girl who is chewing on a chew toy, getting some tactile information to her mouth. So in all of the different areas that we're going to talk about that fall under sensory modulation, you have the ability to have a hypersensitivity and a hyposensitivity. So a hypersensitivity is when somebody is overly sensitive to sensory input. So that person is feeling a more exaggerated version of what the typical individual would feel. The opposite of that is hyposensitivity. And that's when individuals require more input to feel what the typical individual feels. So if we're talking about your tactile system, let's talk about what dysfunction would look like. So overall, children who, or individuals who struggle with tactile difficulties are gonna have problems with socialization. Um, oftentimes because they aren't experiencing that emotional bond, because uh, it hasn't quite developed, because they don't like the way things feel, um, or hugs from other people, and sometimes you'll see uh, individuals have this need for self-protection. So let's get into the hypersensitive student. So hypersensitive students are feeling overly sensitive to touch. So what that looks like is they're often drawing themselves, moving themselves away from people touching them. They're overly aware of the tags in their shirts or their clothing or the seams on their socks. There's diff discomfort with different kinds of clothing material. So maybe cotton is fine, but wool is, is really aggravating. Often these students are withdrawing from groups and they're resisting playing with others. Many times, um, these students are arming themselves with a weapon. And when I say a weapon, I don't mean something like a knife, but maybe they'll have, a, if they're out on the playground, they'll find a stick and they, they hold onto that stick. So if anybody comes close to them and there's risk of them getting bumped, they have something that they can protect themselves with. Now, the opposite of that is hyposensitivity. And these children, are really unaware when people are touching them, unless it's very intense. They're unaware when their face and their hands are messy, and they don't show a whole lot of reaction to pain. So they fall, they might even cut themselves and they're bleeding, but they don't really seem to realize it. They don't feel pain. Because they don't feel pain, they often are treating pets really rough or harming other people because they just don't understand what pain is. Um, oftentimes these individuals are really seeking out tactile experiences. So they're liking to rub their hands on the table or they'll be the, the kids that are rolling around on the, the carpet or if there's um, maybe a, a cold surface, they're, they're bringing their face to it. <laughs> they're maybe like licking or rubbing their hands along um, the walls when they're walking. Um, 
So they really feel compelled to touch a lot of different surfaces uh, and often are seeking out messy experiences. So then there's oral hypersensitivity and hyposensitivities. So the hypersensitivity, students are going to um, feel and experience taste much stronger than a typical individual would. And sometimes these individuals even have that gag reflex when they start to have, um, maybe not even food, maybe just somebody touching their, their face or their lips or their mouth and it starts to elicit uh, a gag. Oral hyposensitivity is the exact opposite, where students aren't realizing there's food in their mouth. They're unaware of which side of their mouth food is on, they're overstuffing their mouth, and they really like the intense flavor, really spicy or really flat, sour foods. So many times it's not uncommon to see children with low vision having hypersensitivities in this area, in tactile, uh, the tactile area. And if you think about it, most, a lot of what the information that we get about how things feel, we're first filtering it through our visual system. So I'll take this ball for example. If you were to touch this ball without seeing what it looked like, if I just put it in your hands and you weren't, you didn't have an idea that it's a spiky blue ball and it has some resistance to it. It doesn't really, it's not squeezable. So if I just put this in your hand without any sort of information, most of us get our information from our vision. So if you don't have that and you go and somebody's asking you to touch it, it can be a really surprising uh, experience. So a lot of times people with, vi with visual impairments uh, end up getting their hands put into different experiences because we want them to touch and smell and get use their other senses to experience things, but they're not quite prepared, their tactile system isn't quite prepared and to handle how it feels. So many times when I work with students with visual impairments, I will explain what they're about to touch before they touch it. So it gives them some information before they're just putting their hands on it. The next sense we're going to talk about is your vestibular sense. And that sense is really helping you develop a relationship with the earth. So it's telling you whether or not you're moving, how quickly, and in what direction you're moving. So it's really your sense of safety and knowing that your feet are on the ground. It allows you to maintain an upright body posture, which supports the visual system. And your receptors are found in the inner ear. So some examples of vestibular activities are swinging on a swing. This little boy is on a scooter board. This little girl is doing a somersault, so moving her head in an upside down position. These little ones are bouncing on a hippity hop. So let's talk about what dysfunction looks like in the area of vestibular processing. So oftentimes children with vestibular dysfunction have uh, a poor self-esteem because they don't really feel secure. So that hypersensitivity is considered an intolerance for movement. So children with hypersensitivity often do not like uh, playground activities like swinging, spinning. They're often very cautious and slow moving. Um, they may appear to be sedentary, but it's more because they're afraid of how that movement feels and they are more likely to resist taking risks. They may be uncomfortable in elevators and escalation, escalators. They have motion sickness and oftentimes they really like to have that continued support from a trusted adult. And then you have the opposite of that, which is hyposensitivity, where these children are really craving a lot of movement. So they really need to keep on moving. There's excessive jumping, rocking. Uh, they really like to move their head in an upside down position. They are the thrill seekers that you work with and they do not experience dizziness. So they're moving around a ton. Um, 
So when I think about uh, children with dysfunction in this area, I, I want to just mention that your vestibular and your visual system run close together in the brain. So sometimes we'll get to our visual processing in a couple minutes, but sometimes when students are doing things like hand flapping, they're giving themselves some two different kinds of input and you have to kind of decide, figure out where it's coming from. So this to the average person might look like it's a visual self-stimulation. However, that also is giving you, your body, the idea of movement. Because when you're moving your hands in your periphery, that almost makes it seem like something is going by you. So there's often some of these self-stimulatory behaviors that we see in children with low vision that might actually not be due to their low vision. It might be due to their need for vestibular input. The last section I need to just mention in this vestibular dysfunction is gravitational insecurity, which is just a fear of falling. You're anxious when your feet are leaving the ground. So some I, really functional tasks that you could see this in are going a flight of stairs. So if you think about when you go upstairs, you have to lift up one foot and take that foot off the ground for a moment and so and then put it onto the next step. Um, so that's something that you could see a lot of anxiety around. Another thing is when you are completing a bathing routine. So inverting your head back is another, um, it's, it causes some anxiety because your head is inverted and that gravitational insecurity doesn't, doesn't like any sort of head being inverted or your feet leaving the ground. The next area we're going to talk about is proprioception. And proprioception is telling us about our own movement or body position. So it's really integrating your sense of touch and your movement sense. So it's contributing to your body awareness, motor planning, motor control. Proprioceptive receptors are found all throughout your body in your muscles, joints, ligaments, tendons, and connective tissues. It's really your unconscious sense of where your body is and the movement and space. So without proprioception, you'd have to rely on your vision to know where your what your body was doing. So if you're a woman, picture your purse. If you're a man, think about reaching into your pocket. So when you reach into your purse or your pocket, you're using your proprioceptive sense to find what it is that you're looking for. If you didn't have proprioception, you'd have to open up your purse or look into your pocket to really find what it is that you were looking for. So some examples of proprioceptive activities. This is a little boy squishing another boy with a big therapy ball. Any sort of weighted equipment is considered a proprioceptive activity, so weighted vests or weighted blankets. This is a bunch of kids in getting buried in these kind of um, beanbag-like rocks. So when you're using a beanbag, it kind of works on both your tactile sense and also if you're being buried in it or you're snuggling into it, that's working more of your proprioceptive sense. This is a little boy in a body sock. So it's this Lycra uh, sock that you put on and then when you push against the Lycra, it's giving input to your joints. And then tug of war, you're really pulling. Anything where you're pulling or pressing against something that's um, bringing attention to your joints and muscles. This is a little boy who's pulling a therapy band. So that resist the resistance is giving proprioceptive input to his body. So what does dysfunction look like? Generally, proprioceptive dysfunction, children or individuals look clumsy. 
So when you have a hypersensitivity, this is less common. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing it. Hypersensitivity is when you're so aware of your muscles and your joints to the point where it's uncomfortable. Um, so sitting in certain positions is really bothersome. Um, there's an example of you know, the difference between wearing flat shoes versus heels. It just puts your joints in a different position and that awareness is so uncomfortable for individuals. But hypersensitivity in proprioceptive area is very uncommon. Hyposensitivity is really what you tend to see. So individuals with hyposensitivity are deliberately bumping and crashing into items and materials. So they're really seeking out a lot of um, input to their joints and their muscles. So they're getting it by stomping their feet, slapping their feet while they're walking, maybe kicking the front of the, the back of the chair of the person who's sitting in front of them. They're crashing into things, maybe rubbing um, their hands together or on the table. Maybe they're biting their fingers or sucking on their fingers. They often like their clothing to be really tight, so their shoelaces are tied really tight or um, wearing hoods or belts really tight. And then another thing that you'll see in the hyposensitivity range is a decreased graded movement. So when you're not really aware of how much force you're using to complete an activity. So oftentimes individuals are holding materials too tightly. Um, because of that, they have really messy written work. They're often breaking toys or materials because they don't realize that they're squeezing it too hard or they're um, using too much force during the play. Uh, oftentimes they're picking up objects with too much force. And then decreased body awareness or motor planning also falls under this area and that's really just planning and executing movement. Um, and oftentimes a very functional task you'll see difficulties with is dressing and undressing because it, if you're not really quite sure where your body is in space, it's really hard to get your arm through the sleeve and then push that other arm through the sleeve to put the shirt over your head. There's a lot of um, knowing where your body is during dressing activities. We've gotten to visual processing. So visual processing is how our bodies are interpreting visual input. So it's not only just the acuity of seeing things, but it's how you're seeing things. It's distinguishing color, it's depth perception and visual perception. So some examples of some visual tasks are, this is a uh, glitter wand. So when you turn it upside down, you see all the glitter all to the other side. Um, lava lamps, if you uh, have had the fortune of seeing a lava lamp, they're pretty cool. You just get to look at the way the globs of color kind of move through the liquid. This is a, uh, a wand that lights up. When you press the button, it lights up and then it also spins around. So that gives a lot of input to your visual system. So for dysfunction, if you are hypersensitive to light, you're overly sensitive to visual input. So it's not only just light, but it's all sorts of visual input. These individuals may have trouble making or keeping eye contact. They're withdrawing from bright light and having a hard time really visually attending to maybe work on paper. Maybe it's visually attending to a conversation or some sort of activity. Um, individuals in this area also often have trouble finding objects in a really cluttered area. So if you're opening up a drawer and you say get the pencil and they have to reach in and there's scissors and glue sticks in that same drawer, they're going to have a harder time um, being able to take that material that you're asking for. Um, 
Hyposensitivity is when you are seeking out visual stimulation. So in this case, you'll see individuals staring into bright lights. They're really liking um, spinning objects or very visually stimulating objects. And sometimes you'll even see these students lining up materials. So just a little side note on that. Some of the things that I say you may see in these sensory processing dysfunctions, you might also see in some other um, diagnoses. So some of the things I've said, you, I could say, I also see these features in children with autism. So you have to think about what the diagnosis is and if, if that's a part of a, an overall diagnosis um, versus maybe having components of sensory processing dysfunction. And auditory processing is how our bodies are interpreting auditory input. So it's including volume, tone, direction of sound, distinguishing the differences between sound. So listening to music or listening to anything in headphones is going to give you an auditory experience. And sometimes too much auditory information is a lot and so noise canceling headphones might eliminate some of the auditory information in your environment. And what does this function look like? So you have a hyposensitivity where there's an over sensitivity to noise. So many times students become very upset in response to loud sounds like fire drills or bells. They might cover their ears or become really agitated. Uh, when the noise in the environment gets to be to a certain uh, level. They're easily distracted by other sounds inside or outside of the environment. So I often think about when you're in like maybe a lecture in a room where there's a fan going on in the room. If you have typical sensory processing, you would be able to notice that fan, but filter it out and pay attention to the, the person who's lecturing, the, the information that's important at the time. Somebody with dysfunction in this area are going to notice that fan and then become so distracted that, by that fan that they're unable to concentrate on any of the information that the presenter is giving or really any information in the environment. They get so focused on that. And then your hyposensitivity is where you're under-registering noise from the environment. So this is when you really don't notice when your name is being called, you can't locate the source of sound, they're not responding to their name, um, they may like to make a lot of sounds with their mouth because they, they need more sound to feel typical. So if there is no sound in the environment, they will produce it by their own mouths or hands or feet or tapping on the table. Um, they're producing more sound. And they may not speak as clearly as other children. And smell is another sense not to be forgotten, and that's considered your dominant sense in humans. So it's important for survival because it can help us Warn, it warns us whether or not there's something hazardous in our environment. And smell and taste are closely linked. So in all of the different areas, you can have a sensory defensiveness. And sensory defensiveness is response to a certain harmless situation as if it were dangerous or painful. So it's an overactivation of our, our protective system. It activates that fight or flight response. So many people are familiar with tactile defensiveness. That seems to be the most well-known, where um, children are actually feeling like very overwhelmed with any sort of tactile information. So because of that, Patricia Willebarger developed the brushing protocol. And the purpose of the brushing protocol is to really bombard the tactile system in an attempt to normalize your tactile receptors. So the brushing protocol you, is a, a very strict protocol. It is completed every two hours and it's in a very specific manner. So if you have any questions about brushing, you should look at your resources and talk to your occupational therapist.
because if you do start brushing somebody and they don't have true tactile defensiveness or they have that defensiveness but you brush them with the wrong technique it could actually cause uh, a lot of aversion and anxiety so you don't want to do that. So this slide really shows us that the middle range of this is our optimal arousal level. So the typical individual you wake up in the morning and you have some sort of activity that's going to spike. So on the bottom you see those little pyramids of this um, chart. And those pyramids are showing some sort of activity. So say you wake up in the morning and you take your shower. That's going to be the first spike in. That will spike your arousal level. And then you eat breakfast and then that's going to increase your arousal level. And then you get in the car and you drive and that spikes your arousal level. And throughout the day, whatever you do, whoever you are, your arousal level increases. So at the end of the day, you're more likely to be, to start out, to end up at a higher arousal level than you woke up in the morning. So for a typical individual, that's okay because you end up in that optimal level of arousal for most of the day. And maybe you only end up in that higher arousal level at the end of the day. But if you have somebody who already starts out and they're hypersensitive and they have a lot of anxiety with sensory activities, they're already starting out at that over aroused level. And then you're trying to do things throughout their day to help bring them down, some calming activities to help them be able to get into that optimal level of arousal. And then on the other side of that, on the bottom of this chart, which would be the blue line, you have students who are low arousal. So uh, for whatever reason, it might be their neurological state, maybe it's due to medication or whatnot, but you're constantly doing things throughout the day to try to spike their level of arousal, to get them into that optimal level of arousal so that they can learn. I worked at a local hospital and they had a behavioral support team that they would call whenever there was a crisis, a uh, behavioral crisis. And they took data on the frequency of those calls and found that the highest numbers of calls were happening between 5 and 7 p.m. in the evening. Which isn't really a huge surprise knowing this information because we know that that's probably the time where students were able to hold themselves together all day long and then during that five to seven time they really just couldn't hold it together anymore and that's when they had those behavioral outbursts. So I, I think about working at a school and oftentimes parents will say my child just falls apart at the end of the day and they have all these difficulties in the area of sensory processing but we don't necessarily see it at school and that's not uncommon so uh, it's just something to consider when you're working with uh, families or if you're a parent that really struggles at the end of the day it's th there may be a reason and so we'll talk about some sensory strategies in part two that you can use to help avoid that meltdown time so that we finished talking about sensory modulation and we're going to talk about sensory discrimination now and sensory discrimination is using sensory input to complete functional activities. So it allows us to understand things about ourselves and the world around us without having to test them every single time. Sensory discrimination allows us to perceive qualities of sensation, similarities of sensation, and then the differences between sensations. Sensory discrimination develops with neurological maturation. So it's always going to take precedence over that sensory defensiveness in day-to-day -day situations. So as a child or an individual matures, he becomes less, he or she becomes less self-protective to every single sensation in the environment and becomes more discrimi discriminatory about what is happening to their body at that moment in the environment. Because we learn, at least in um, an environment like the United States or an environment that's pretty stable, true th threats rarely occur. So you, you learn to function with that sensory discrimination 
versus the defensiveness. Now, if you were in a country where there really was a true risk of bombings or um, some sort of like animals there that, that might be a threat to you, then you may start to work under that defensive um, arena versus the discrimination. But generally speaking, you learn that threats rarely occur. Postural responses are, are what is allowing upright posture against gravity. So your balance and your bilateral coordination allows you to experiment with movements and positions. Bilateral coordination is using both sides of your body in a coordinated way. So you can use both sides of your body to complete the same action, like clapping your hands together, both sides of the body doing the same thing. You can use both sides of your body in an alternating way, like climbing the stairs. So your both sides of the body is doing the same exact thing, just in a reciprocal or alternating manner. Or both sides of the body can do two different things, where you're stabilizing a material and using your other hand to manipulate it. <clears throat> Another component of sensory processing is praxis. So praxis is known as motor planning. It's really your ability to plan, sequence, and execute, execute motor movements. So motor planning does not occur at birth. This really develops over time with practice. So if you think about a, an infant, when they're first laying on their back, they're using maybe reflexes for their movement patterns. So their, their reflex and, and their arms are kind of moving and somehow if you, if you have toys positioned above them, maybe their arms are bumping into those toys, but they don't really have a whole lot of control. But they start to realize like, oh, hmm, okay. As they start to move out of those reflexive patterns and they're experimenting with their body, they start to realize, okay, this movement in this manner gets that toy to move. And then you start to do it over and over again and learn, okay, like this is reaching. I'm reaching out to this toy and this is getting me what I want. So that's like the very basic um, beginnings of motor planning. But if you think about during your, your life now, maybe as an adult, you may do things that require new motor learning. So I'll take an example of myself. I've been trying to learn how to do a headstand in yoga. The first time I did it, I could not do it at all. Like there was no way I couldn't just look at somebody doing the headstand and replicate it. I had to practice getting my body into that position. It really helped when I had somebody um, guiding my, my limbs so I knew how it felt. And then slowly and slowly I've been able to do it on my own. But it took lots and lots of repetition, repetition lots of opportunities to practice it. So this is a video of a little girl who is in ballet class. And she is trying to follow the directions to learn first position. So you will watch the teacher give, or listen to the teacher give directions, but then also watch her respond to her peers around her, and then the strategies she uses to help herself try to get into that position. This video is not auditorily described, but I will discuss it at the end of the video. Yes, all right. See if you can make your shoes look just like my shoes. Can you get those heels to touch? That's it, Ashley. Good. Good. Oh, this looks so nice. Brianna, can you get your heels to touch for me? See how I'm making kind of like a letter B? It's tricky. Miss Kimberly, will you make sure that everyone's trying it? Mm -hmm. All right. I know it's so tricky. Oh, yeah, that looks so pretty because she's doing a great job. All right. Let's hold on our umbrellas again. Hold them over here by the right side. We'll give them a click. Okay. Good. Hold on to my shoulder. Now, here's what we have to do to pretend. Oh, 
Now we have to pretend that we're reaching outside of the umbrella to see if we feel a raindrop. Look at this. I reached for a raindrop. Guess what? I felt a raindrop. So my arm comes back in like this. In! Good. It's okay if your shoes aren't doing it. Don't worry, okay? Just try. So if you took a, when you were paying attention to that video, things that you should notice is that first, the little girl wasn't able to just listen to the verbal directions about her, the position of her hands and her feet. So then she started looking around at the people around her. And she was looking and looking and trying to get some visual cues from those around her. When those visual cues didn't quite work, she then went to actually picking up her feet and moving her feet so that she would position them in correctly or try to position them correctly. And she still was struggling. So thinking about your prompting hierarchy, so using your verbal strategies, using visual supports, and then uh, using your physical assistance. And when it comes to motor planning, especially with students with visual impairments, especially with students who have motor planning difficulties, it is actually helpful to provide that physical cue. So actually allowing them to feel what that movement of the position is going to feel like. And every time they even if you're helping them put them in that position, their brain is forming a connection. Um, synapses in the brain are forming and it's going to reinforce that motor learning. This is uh, a graphic of how your body develops and it shows that at the very, very foundation of our development, sensory processing occurs. So if you think about being able to do anything higher level, you first have to get that sensory modulation in check. And then you're going to be better able to learn the sensory discrimination skills like bilateral coordination and motor planning. And then you're able to jump up and work on social skills, work on visual perceptual activities. So really getting that um, that foundation is is helpful for learning. So you really need to do some bigger gross motor uh, organizing activities in order to get some fine motor um, learning. Sensory processing disorders was first recognized by Dr. Jean Ayers, and it was originally called sensory integration dysfunction. Uh, where, when there is sensory processing dysfunction, all sorts of other you know, social, emotional, motor, functional problems can result. So Dr. Jean Ayers really described sensory processing disorder as this, this neurological traffic jam that's really preventing certain parts of the brain from getting information that it really needs to interpret that information correctly. So the causes of sensory processing disorder are still being researched. Uh, the Sensory Processing Foundation cites preliminary research saying that it's inherited, but there's other theories that include uh, prenatal and birth complications or environmental factors that might be involved. So there's a question we received, what is the major physical aspects that affect sensory processing during infancy? And I would say it's basically your experiences. So everything that you are doing as you are um, going through your day-to-day -day life is providing you uh, sensory experiences. And in part two of this webinar, I'm going to discuss how we really can address sensory processing difficulties. And um, most of the treatment of sensory processing difficulty is all around exposure and practice. Sensory processing disorder is not an accepted diagnosis in the ICD-10. Um, it was a proposed diagnosis for the DSM-5, but it was not accepted. Um, it was considered that there was more research required. 
but it is an accepted diagnosis in Stanley Greenspan's Diagnostic Manual for Infancy and Early Childhood. It's called uh, Regulation Disorders of Sensory Processing. The proposed diagnosis for the DSM-5 are sensory modulation disorder, sensory based motor disorder, and sensory discrimination disorder. I'm not going to go into detail about um, the definition of these proposed diagnoses, but if you're interested, ask your occupational therapist. Assessment. There's unfortunately not a, a whole lot of assessment uh, tools out there that don't rely on uh, parent report or clinical observation. So that's that's the number one, like the big thing that we really rely on as occupational therapists to uh, diagnose some sort of sensory processing disorder. And the sensory profile and the sensory processing measure are two questionnaire-based um, assessments that are often used. The sensory integration praxis test, otherwise known as the SIPT, is a very standardized test and it has norms and the difficulty with that test is it, it tends to uh, test more of your higher functioning sensory discrimination skills like balance, coordination, motor planning, and you have to have a fair amount of ability to follow directions to participate in that testing, so um, it it's, might not be appropriate for many individuals that you're, you're questioning sensory processing difficulties. There was a question from an occupational therapist who was asking about the limited assessment tools that he or she had, and um, it, it, it's not limited, that's kind of where we are as a, a profession right now. Um, we really rely on a lot of the clinical observations. So sensory processing dysfunction impacts your ability to attend and focus, your ability to achieve and maintain an optimal state of alertness for learning. It's influencing social skills and behavior. So I just want to highlight some resources that might be helpful, uh, especially for parents. There's uh, a bibliography that will be uh, associated with this webinar and on it the out of sync child is a, a really great resource that explains all of these different areas and the dysfunction in a very succinct way um, so that's a resource that might be worth checking out thank you so much for part one of this two-part and as you said we're going to get into two part uh, part two we're going to get into part two in a little more depth out of all of the uh, sensory stimuli, I wonder if you have a feeling of um, kind of the most important. What would be the most important sensory stimuli for students who have visual impairments? Well, I, I can't say that, that, that there's one area that's more important than the other. It really depends on what the profile of the student is looking like. So if you have a student with low vision who is demonstrating defensiveness in the area of tactile information, you would want to maybe limit the amount of tactile input that they are initially receiving and help giving, giving them those verbal cues and the opportunities to explore materials at their own pace and at their own level. But you also really want to provide other access to other different areas. So your vestibular system is a really important one. Oftentimes you'll see um, people with yes. low low vision rocking or, or they're they're seeking out that vestibular input. So um, providing other maybe more typical ways of getting that input, maybe using a swing or, or having opportunities um, to bounce on the ball to get that input in a way um, at an appropriate time so that when they have to sit it's not interfering. But then you have to think about is that rocking really interfering with what they're doing and making that call. But I would say access to all of the different sensory 
um, components are important. I wouldn't say one is greater than the other. It really just depends on uh, the profile of that student. One thing that you talked about when we were talking about motor planning and particularly watching the little girl in ballet class and it made me think about you describing your yoga experience and how you know when you're in yoga class you have to kind of feel that posture and the instructor walks around and helps you feel the stretch or the position or the balance and um, and I thought that too for kids with visual impairments because they're because they can't observe as you said to start with that observation and then move to the you know some of that hand under hand technique or modeling to show them a position that then they can understand physically what that position is if they can't get a verbal description of it. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question from one of our O and M instructors um, that that was really interesting. I'm going to read part of it, but um, just to make sure I capture what his question was, but it had to do a lot with environmental monitoring when you're teaching O&M and using uh, sound cues and auditory information to learn your route or to make decisions um, and to monitor your safety. And he talks about um, the absence of a positive signal. And what he means by that is, he says, students are instructed to cross the street in the absence of traffic. Um, and he was wondering how you respond to the absence of something. Uh, he says, is, is responding to the absence of sensory information the same, or is it different than responding to the presence of sensory information? Are you, or do you just ignore that distinction saying the absence of traffic is the presence of silence, for example? I think this question gets to what is processing auditory information mm -hmm. and the processing of that auditory information um, is what it is. So you're either processing that you hear something or you don't hear it. Mm -hmm. I think it then you go with the cognitive component of not hearing something means do this or hearing mm -hmm. something means do that. So I think about the sensory processing of it is is similar. It's it remains pretty constant whether or not that you're processing it. It's not that you're I guess if I would look at it as if they didn't hear the sound or they weren't aware of the sound, mm -hmm. then that would maybe be some dysfunction. But if you're thinking about what your response is mm -hmm. to whether there is sound or not sound, that is more of that cognitive learning and that cognitive component that you have to teach. Thanks. That's, that's helpful. Um, it was interesting to hear him um, think about it that way and to think about all the other um, service providers in the student's educational program who are not necessarily in the classroom or content teachers that may be their speech or you mentioned the OT, could be their speech therapist, could be their um, personal assistant. And all of them have to kind of be aware of what this student's processing abilities are and how to help them use that information in a more positive way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, from my perspective as the occupational therapist working with teams of people, that it's the, the OT's job to kind of help you manage these dysfunctions. But many of the, much of the information that we get that help us say, okay, this is this student does seem to have a hypersensitivity or mm -hmm. hyposensitivity. Many times an occupational therapist isn't in the classroom as many hours as teaching sure. assistants, teachers. Um, and, and so we're really relying on that information, which is why I think it's really helpful for people to understand what these different components of sensory processing are, what that dysfunction looks like, mm -hmm. so that you're able to bring it to either the parents or um, the OT if you're fortunate enough to work with an OT and say here are the things what is can, can you look into that further what should we do um, and so that's why I think it's really important to to have this information. Great and that's what we're going to get to in part two. So part one helping to outline what all of those uh, sensory processing areas are and as we get into part two we will be able to talk about how to use that information uh, in the in your daily educational plan.
Again, our thanks to Amanda Martinage and to our participants who submitted questions and ideas for this talk. Find more video presentations and opportunities to earn continuing education credits at www.perkinsylearning.org.